The following podcast contains explicit language. One definition of explicit language is stated clearly and in detail, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. That's why we use those words. Hello and welcome to episode 341 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. This is going to air on Monday, March 14th, which means you are two days away from the April registration deadline on Wednesday, March 16th. We have an upcoming guest on the show Tuesday, March 22nd. Uh, we will be interviewing Rachel Gezerse, author of the Law Career Playbook, The Gorilla Guide to Getting a Legal Job You Actually Like. If you have career questions, what do you want to know about the legal market? What do you want to know about how to get a job? Send your questions to help at thinkinglsat.com before March 22nd, and we will pass those along to Rachel Gezerse, who is, what, an adjunct professor at USC Law School, practicing attorney, author yeah. of this book about how to get a job as a lawyer. Yep. Um, yeah, she's somebody who's good to know. So email help at thinkinglsat.com. And uh, we'll pass your questions along. Come to my March 2022 study group. Well, actually, by the time you hear this, it's probably going to be the April 2022 LSAT study group. Anyway, I teach a free class. I call it the study group. It's every other Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. All you need is a demon free account. By the way, not only do you get access to my classes, but you get access to all types of badass shit. The demon free is like a crazily good free resource. And we will invite you to free classes from Ben, free classes from me, free classes to other members of our team. It's an amazing self-study tool, all for free. Uh, just go to lsatdemon.com and sign up for a free account. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but today on the show, it was a bit of a mailbag episode, Ben. Um, we had lots of questions about lots of stuff. We had a couple of clarifications uh, from stuff we talked about on episode 340. Because we spent a lot of time on our scholarship estimator today, uh, encouraging people to go to lsatdemon.com slash scholarships and play with various LSAT and GPA combos. And the very last thing we talked about actually was the underrepresented minority bump that the scholarship estimator gives you. Yep. And we talked about exactly how much of a bump the estimator gives you, which, by the way, is public. It's posted on the website. We want feedback on that. We'd love to know how we're doing, so please let us know. Um, you can email help at lsatdemon.com if you want to give us feedback. We talked about a specific applicant and looked at the various offers that he would get with the URM bump and without the URM bump estimates of what kinds of uh, scholarships he might be able to get and why law schools give uh, a boost to applicants of color. I thought that was the highlight of the show, but lots of other good stuff in the mailbag, I thought. Cool. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hey, before we do that, you want to hear a weird thing about our federal government? Go for it. I have an appointment tomorrow night. I had to schedule this appointment six months in advance. I'm getting my global entry. Well, I hope I'm getting my global entry. I used to have TSA pre, okay, which is like $85. And you know, you skip the security lines on all your flights. Yep. I can't imagine not having it. Yeah. But I also stupidly didn't apply. I should have just got global entry instead. Cause then you skip a lot of security lines on, on, if you ever cross international borders. Yeah. So I'm applying for global entry and I sent in like, you know, it's like, copy of my passport or whatever, whole application, paid the fees. I had to schedule an interview, which they only do at certain border crossings, which are all at airports. Or, I mean, you could also go to a, like, I think, drive to a border crossing, but much easier to go to an airport that's an international border crossing. Yep. I had to schedule an appointment six months in advance to go to this interview, which I'm sure is going to be like four minutes, right? I'm going to get there. Yeah. They're going to make me wait for a half hour and then they're going to talk to me for four minutes. <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know. I mean, otherwise, what are they going to ask me? Yeah. Are you a terrorist? <laughs> you know, wait, but are you really a terrorist? I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what they're possibly going to ask me, but anyway, the, the part that I is just wild to me, the appointment I scheduled it online. The appointment is 8.30 p.m. on Friday night. Wow. Is that not the most weird shit you've ever heard? I'm going to go like talk to customs or 
is it customs? It's it's like U.S. border security. Wow. At the San Francisco International Airport tomorrow night at 8:30 p.m. on a Friday night. On a Friday night, that was the that was the openings. They were all like real late. I think that there were applica- there were windows that were later than that. Jeez. And I had to book it six months six months ago. So they're really it, like busy. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, it's like wow. Okay, you guys are working around the clock, huh? For to these- get these approved. <laughs> I don't know. It's so strange because it's also like, why do you even need me to go there? Why, what? Why can't we Zoom? If you need to talk to me, why can't we just do this online? Yeah. So, no, I'm going to literally drive four fucking hours to go <laughs> to the airport <laughs> just to go get this global entry checked. It's gonna, I know it's going to be a four-minute interview, but it's going to be at 8.30 p.m. Yeah. But now you can pass security lines in uh, international airports. Well, yeah. If I go to, you know, wherever, when I come back, well, I'm sure, you know, Mexico and Canada and wherever else I'm likely to go, they're not going to give a fuck about my global entry. But coming back into the United States, Mm -hmm. it's going to be like, do you have global entry? Here's your separate line. And it's Mm -hmm. just, and it includes TSA pre, which is really why I'm doing it because my TSA pre was about to expire. Mm -hmm. And so I need to re up on that so I can fly. Yeah. yeah. And so I, and I just figured, okay, well this time I'll just get global entry so that it's, I don't know, whatever, 15 more dollars. And it allows you to do the same thing if you're on an international flight. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Anyway, I found it very, very strange that our federal government would like to talk to me at a set at seven 30 PM. Well, yeah. Tell us how your date goes. Dude, I hope I don't get arrested by the, it just feels like such a weird thing. Like it feels like the men in the dark suits are going to like take me to the back room and I'm going to be disappeared or something. (laughs) I'm going to be going to the airport in the dark on a weekend, you know, it just seems so weird, but okay. I'll keep you posted. All right, let's get on with it. All right. You want to start by reading this new review we just got on Apple podcasts? Sure. So this is a one-star review. It says, I started listening to this podcast thinking I would get some educational content to supplement my study. I was wrong! Exclamation point. Occasionally there is an explanation of an LSAT question. Most of the time, most of the time it's two self-stroking guys evangelizing a high LSAT score as the solution to all problems, hawking their LSAT course, and berating emailers, usually students earnestly asking for advice for sending in stupid questions. The latter is touted as a tough love approach when in actuality, (laughs) uh, it's classic bad teaching. Okay. What? (laughs) You put this on the agenda? (laughs) I don't know. I just want to let you know what kind of love we're getting out there for our completely free podcast that we've been doing for seven years. Um, Yeah, there you go. Apple Podcasts. Just two self-stroking guys. Oh, <laughs> uh, boy. Um, uh, the irony is a high LSAT score kind of is the solution to all problems in this space. A high LSAT score will cover up for a bad undergraduate GPA. A high LSAT score will get you to law school for free instead of for $150,000. Yeah. Um, a lot, uh, an, an high LSAT score will let, you know, Dean Z from Michigan know that you have what it takes to succeed in law school. And it will also let her know that you will not bring down the public profile of her school and the rankings of her school. Yeah. So, you know, it, if you're, if you're serious about law school, then you should be serious about a high LSAT score. So it, it is, you know, you can hate us if you want. Um, but we also do deliver high LSAT scores to people. Yeah, it's, it's, it is the solution to all problems in this very narrow space, as you said, right? Like going to law school. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think a high LSAT score is a solution to much else. But <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, I have a very high I, LSAT score. I still have plenty of problems. <laughs> Don't worry. It's, not, it's certainly not going to solve everything. I mean, another thing that would solve problems is just don't go to law school, period. Exactly. Which we say repeatedly, almost too much. Maybe people get annoyed by that as well. But 
I think we're trying to disabuse people from the notion that going to law school with a cl- without a clear understanding of what you're getting into and a clear determination to practice law. Like right. I actually I remember do you remember Zach? He he was a, a law professor that worked yeah. he, he provided admissions consulting sometimes. Zach Kalo, for, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I remember uh, I, geez, it's probably 10, eight years, maybe 10 years at this point when he came uh, to my class and was was talking to everybody and someone asked him something about, you know, hey, what can you use a JD for? And he, he just said, he's like, look, if you're not going to practice law, I don't think you should go to law school. <laughs> yeah. Like, y- yeah, y- you are you're for going to, to get a JD for the practice of law. And I remember sitting in the back of the classroom and kind of like being like, okay, but also feeling like shocked. You know, there's that part of me that's like, yeah, but you know, you got people who, who practice, you know, they want to go um, get a job on the Hill in DC and they need a JD, but they're not going to practice law. I'm like trying to find the exceptions, you know? And it's like, they may or may not exist, but it's... <laughs> fundamentally that's what it is and i imagine that sometimes when people hear us say that they're having that same reaction that i was having eight years ago like hold up hold up and you're like searching for the exception and although they may exist that's just that's the exception and it's a small exception yeah there are far too many lawyers already it's really hard to get jobs as lawyers people are washing out of the legal field all the time there are way way too many students at way too many law schools. Um, you know, the sad reality is that probably half the people that go to law school are going to practice law yeah. and the rest of them are going to have wasted money on a JD. I mean, money just, and time, lots yeah. of money and time. <laughs> yeah. And the time really pales in comparison, honestly, because it's, you know, most of the people who are applying are like young people who are still trying to find something to do with their lives. And, it's, you know, wasting three years of your life. It's not great, but, um, you know, it, <laughs> it's recoverable, right? <laughs> it is a precious resource. You know, that's true, but you do have to do things when you're young and try them and see if they're good for you. Uh, yeah. it's a, it's a long, that is a long trial period. You know, people like, like me go to law school, hate it, stick it out, anyway, when I knew, I mean, after a year, it was like, there's no fucking way I'm going to be doing this. Yeah. And I stuck it out anyway, which was dumb. Um, and people end up, yeah, impoverishing themselves. Yeah. Because it's way, way, way too expensive for what it is. Um, anyway, yeah. Sorry you didn't like our free podcast. Um, ready for another email? Sure. Cool. This one comes from Jennifer. It says, thank you so much for your help, exclamation point. I got my score of 177 today, exclamation point. I started with a diagnostic of 155. I worked through the free content from Khan Academy for three months and scored a 160 in October. In spite of scoring slightly better, I felt more confused and less confident than when I took my diagnostic. Your podcasts and The Demon changed everything for me. I was the first woman in my family to go to college. I don't have anyone in my life offering direction or counseling. In fact, my parents actively discouraged me from pursuing an education since I was a teenager. Your podcast filled a need I didn't know I had. I know you guys get a lot of crap for being assholes, well, or self-stroking, that too. But I needed it straight. I felt like I was being patronized or manipulated anywhere else. If people think you guys are assholes, maybe they'll find what they want elsewhere. The only way I could consider going to law school was to go for free. Now that's exactly what I'm going to do, exclamation point. I'm honestly sad to be done with the LSAT. I got to the point that I looked forward to studying every day. And that's, that's from uh, Jennifer. Wow. <laughs> uh, a 177 over a 160. It's just a completely different stratosphere. Yeah, diagnostic 155 and mm-hmm. 22 total point improvement from diagnostic to final official score. Um, spun her wheels with other prep for a while, came to us and it clicked. We are going to give it to you straight. Um, you know, it, it is, it, trust me, 
I love my students. I love what I do. I, it is tough love from my end. But it, it, if, if it sounds to you like I'm an asshole, then that's fine. Go somewhere else. Good. <laughs> I'm glad you tried it out for free. Uh, I'm glad you listened to the podcast for free. Um, you can try our free classes. Uh, go get a free account, lsatdemon.com slash free. We, have, we had a huge free Logic Games um, workshop this last week. I do my study group every other Tuesday, uh, Thursday night. I have one tonight, actually, not as you listen to this, but every other Thursday night I do a study group. I really look forward to it. Um, yeah. You can ask me any question you want. And if you think I'm an asshole and you just can't stand it, then fine, go go prep somewhere else. That's great. I don't want your money. <laughs> I don't. No hard feelings. Yeah. No. Yeah. Really. Like that's fine. I'm not. I am not trying to be all things to all people, but I am inspired. I'm motivated by the emails that I get from people like Jennifer, and I receive emails like that every fucking week. It's not even surprising anymore when we help somebody make a 20 point improvement and that 20 point improvement is going to completely change the path of their legal career. Jennifer is going to get into an entirely higher class of law schools. And I mean, a school that was going to never admit her is now going to offer her a full ride to go there with a 20. I mean, like that's dozens of schools are going to do that. Dozens of schools that would have dismissed her with a 155 or a 160 wouldn't even have thought about it. There's no fucking way you're getting in to, you know, UCLA or whatever. No way. And now that same school is going to be offering her a full ride. And there's like dozens <clears> of those <throat> schools. And there's dozens or hundreds of students, applicants like this. So that's what we do it for. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. I'm surprised that her parents actively discouraged her from pursuing an education since she was a teenager. It's not that surprising, man. She's a she's from a, a a family where either nobody in her family went to college or no women in her family went to college. Mm. And that doesn't surprise me that much that people who didn't go to college don't recognize the value of an education, especially if there's some weird, you know, like gender issues and religious things and they want her to just like pump out kids that doesn't surprise me at all um yeah it's given just, my background just, it's um yeah i just wondered what their rationale was you know um i mean we're discouraging people to go <laughs> to law school all the time <laughs> yeah but that's but not you don't get that much education reasons. in law school let's be honest <laughs> i mean what do you actually learn if, especially if you're not going to literally practice law you don't learn anything of value. Oh, I thought I thought I learned a lot of valuable stuff. I don't know. Really? Well, valuable may not be the right term. What is it? Yeah, I would say. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying it was worth the cost. <laughs> no, certainly not. But that. I would. I would definitely not say that the value was zero. Um, I, I think that there were, yeah, the understanding how the legal system works in a, just like a, a general sense in a way that people don't have any sense, right? How many people just go around yeah, saying, but, oh, well, that's ben. unconstitutional. And it's like... Uh, yeah, of course. You also could have learned all of that on Wikipedia in a week. <laughs> <laughs> For well, real. I, you I, didn't I, learn anything that you actually use in your real life. It is nice to know... Oh, I see. There's like the trial courts and there's the appellate courts. Yeah, okay. I see how they operate. Like, see a difference yeah, yeah. in those things. Like, okay, that makes sense. All right, got that. And there's like some, I don't, but I mean, like practical reality. So people ask me all the time, you know, yeah. oh, well, but you know, I, you don't practice law, but sure, it's, it must be really valuable for your business. It must be real valuable for your for running Look, I'm business. Not, I'm not. I'm just saying that the value isn't zero. I remember like okay. being in class and be like, "Oh, that I I hadn't realized how that all came together." There's this idealized notion of how government works, and then there's the the I guess the practical realization of how I don't know how much of a system it is. Like I even just remember having realizations in trusts and estates, being like, "Okay, well." You literally cannot like rely on any sort of institution to get what you need. You really have to like plan and lawyer up. That's just like, I don't know, those sorts of things. I'm not saying they're well, worth dollars, right? Dollars compared to hundreds of thousands of dollars I, in time that was spent. 
I learned two, two main things of value. Sure. Okay. So it's not zero. It's certainly not zero. Yeah. It does round to zero when compared to the actual cost. It rounds to zero. <laughs> it's not a good idea if you're just yes, like wanting yes. to be a better citizen or whatever like that. Because yeah. people literally tell us that. Like, well, yeah. even if I don't practice law, I just want to be a more equipped, better In, citizen. Informed. Like, yeah, yeah. What? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you could There's a lot more. of ways you could get informed besides wasting three years and $150,000, $200,000. Anyway, um, two things that I learned to value. Mm-hmm. One. When the lawyer's into the room, everyone loses. It's the most miserable day of your life when the lawyers are there. You do not want to fuck with lawyers ever. You just don't. If, like, if you can avoid it, you do not want lawyers in your house. <laughs> I have frequent lawyer house guests, by the way, and they're an exception. But we're not doing lawyer shit when they're in my house. Yeah. Um, you, it's just bad times. Like A deposition is the worst day of your life. A any, oh my God, it's just awful. It sucks. It's fighting over zero sum almost always. And it's miserable. I I agree. And that's where that phrase lawyers always win comes from, right? Because it doesn't matter which side loses or wins. Both sides, lawyers take home salary. Oh yeah. Well, there's like the, it's a cliche too. uh, Well, maybe that's not the right word, but anyway, it's like kind of a stupid old saying of, um, a solo practitioner, a single lawyer, the only lawyer in a small town can make a good living. Mm. Two single lawyers in that same small town can each make a great living. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's, that's a sad reality. That is a sad truth. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so I, I learned that I would like to avoid lawyers at all costs, which is something that we do uh, in, our own, in our own business, right? Like we don't, we try not to talk to lawyers. That said, if we ever got entangled in legal matters, this is the other thing that I learned. You cannot figure it out yourself, even if you went to law school. And you want to go hire the very best attorney you can possibly afford. Yeah. Because money's going to win. The better attorney is going to win. The better attorney is going to cost more money. And if you want to win legal matters, you, you want to fight, you want to fight those battles with dollars. Yep. (laughs) So I had one of those miserable (laughs) lessons that I learned. I had one of those aha moments. I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it, it, it was a way, way overpriced uh, realization, but I, I just remember thinking, okay, like I think I had grown up with this idea that if you were ever, um, you know, entangled in something, this, on some level, maybe the system could work it out for you. I don't know. It's just, an, it's just a, a naive view. And it was like, I was like, wait, nope, that's not it. Nope. You got to, well, or you got to defend yourself within the system. Or how about the naive idea that you could figure it out because it was rational? Like it was yeah. it's like what you thought it was a rational rules based system mm-hmm. that was based in science. And yeah. you're like, well, I'm a man of science. I mean, I'm like a good reader. I'm a yeah. pretty smart guy. I can figure things out. Like I, if ask me to unravel a certain, I just have to read up on it. Yeah. Bullshit. You'd have to read up on it. No. Yeah. You don't know what any of it means unless you actually practice law in that field, in that jurisdiction. Yep. And that's why it's like, oh, if you want to win, you just have to go spend money on fancy lawyers because yep. they, it, it doesn't mean what you think it means. Like <laughs> I, I've told this story on the podcast before and we'll keep it moving. We got a whole bunch of emails to get to, but I was getting an A in my contracts class in my 1L, first semester, 1L year contracts, aced it, killed it. Got an A. At the same time, I was trying to quit working for my old employer and start my own business. And I went, oh, let me just get out my employment contract. Just give that a read. (laughs) Read through my whole employment contract. Oh, let's see here. Well, okay, so we've got a non-compete clause spells out very specifically how I'm not allowed to compete with my former employer. Oh, there's my signature. There's consideration. I, I was paid to do this job. 
fairly signed, you know, official. Mm -hmm. Paging through. Okay, uh, there's a choice of jurisdiction clause. In, uh, I, I have signed away, you know, I, I am committed to litigating this contract in South Carolina. South Carolina. I know what that means. <laughs> That's where the company is from. Yeah. You know, yeah. okay, yeah. I know. So I know what that means. So, okay, so we're going to have to litigate, clearly, have to litigate this in South Carolina. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> choice of law clause. Let's look at the laws of South Carolina. We'll go over. You know, I'm like going through all the things and I like, I know what the names of all the things are. I just got an A in my contracts class. Yeah, yeah. I read it all and I'm like, I'm well and truly fucked. Like I got, I got no chance here. This document, yeah. I'm fucked. There's no way yep. they're going to let me do this. Yep. I took it to my contracts professor that I had just gotten an A from. And he's like, yeah, well, um, I've got this former student who practices here in town. Why don't you reach out to them and see what they have to say? Yeah. And I'm like, well, but I mean, I already know what it says. I, okay, fine. You know, I'll, I'll, before I give up entirely on this plan of starting a business, I'll, based on this document, I'll go talk to this, you know, and I don't know why they even did it. I don't, I, it made no sense, but I sat down with her and like a, a, a partner at the firm. Wow. I know. Like what? Like, they had no bit, uh, there's no reason for them to meet with me. Anyway, they looked at it and in 15 minutes they were like, yeah, well, but here's the thing. Um, they could litigate that in South Carolina. And what you would do is you would just, well, they're like, um, do you have any property in South Carolina? No. Do you ever go to South Carolina? No. Do you have any business in South Carolina? No. <laughs> okay. Well, so here's what'll happen. They'll, if anything, they'll sue you in South Carolina. You don't even defend yourself. They'll win summary judgment. They'll have a judgment from the state of South Carolina. And then if they try to come and enforce that judgment in the state of California, California has a strong presumption against non-compete policies and the state of California is not going to enforce that judgment. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the, uh, the reality of experience, right? It's like, yeah, it, here's it's how like, it's actually going to go down. Yep. Right. And so, you know, when we say things like, you don't learn how to practice law in law school. You're only going to learn from practicing on the job. Yeah. It's because of shit like that where, you know, you just law school teaches you all this theory and all this like real high minded, you know, lofty bullshit, but it does, you don't, you're not, you're not going to learn, you know, you, you can't actually do it, you know? So like, and then, so now imagine Ben, when we get emails, like we do all the time, you know, I really feel for these people because they're like, well, I, I want to go to law school because I, there's many people in my family that are in jail or whatever. And I want to, I want to, I want to represent my, I'm yeah. going to represent my family. <clears throat> You'd have to go to law school and then actually practice in that domain for years yeah. to become, and then even within that domain, there are different sub specialties. You're still going to be bad. You're still not yeah. going to be able to defend. You do not defend your own fucking family. That's yeah. not what you do. That's not what any good lawyer would do. Yeah. You could go to law school. You could, um, yeah, you, you could, you could do that. You could become a criminal lawyer, but you're still not going to be like just walking into court on behalf of all of your family members in prison or whatever. Like that's just, <laughs> you'll lose. Yeah. You're not an expert in their jurisdiction. Well, think about this. Yeah. I mean, as you just said, some of the best lawyers, when they get into trouble, they hire someone else to represent obviously. them. Yeah. Uh, obviously. It's the first thing they would do. They're the most yeah. savvy person in the game and they are going to know immediately. Oh, well, I obviously can't do that myself. Mm -hmm. You could be a brilliant preeminent lawyer. You're the very first thing you're going to do is like, Oh, okay. So what badass am I going to hire to represent me? I need that outside perspective. <laughs> Certainly not going to represent myself. Yeah. God. Uh, anyway. Okay. Let's uh, Jennifer. Congratulations. Good job going to law school for free. These are the people that we really want to help. You know, I, I, I will apologize in advance and you can feel free to walk away. If your dream is to improve from a 147 to a 152 so that you can squeak in the back door and pay full price of some regional law school, I'm out. I, I don't want to do that for you. I don't want your money. 
I, I, I do not want to be complicit in this giant scam. I don't want to help you. I'm not going to give you just enough rope to hang yourself. I do not want that for you. I, I feel like I would be doing you a disservice if I improved your LSAT by seven points and that was enough for you to squeak in. I'm not, that's not what we do here. We're in the business of saving people $150,000 on law school. So be like Jennifer or go somewhere else. Like <laughs> if you're going to come to us, we're going to transform the way you approach the test. We're going to transform your LSAT score. That's our goal for you. Not like shitty incremental improvement. We're going to teach you that the test actually makes sense and you're going to kill it and you're going to go to law school for free. Or I feel like we will have hurt you. We're not part of the scam, y'all. <laughs> like part of the reason why we're not giving you, you know, the same kind of like pats on the head that the law schools are giving you is that they ultimately, they just want your application. They want your money. And, and I don't, I don't care. You can study with us or not. <laughs> but like, if you do study with us, we're going to give it to you straight about not just the LSAT, but about the whole broader game. Anyway, yep. last words on that? Nope. <laughs> okay. Next one. Go for it. Yeah. This, this is, is by the way, from our Francesca uh, who teaches for us. Oh, okay, uh, cool. At the Demon. Yeah. I was wondering that. All right. On this week's Thinking LSAT episode 340, you guys answered a question about the personality type best suited to lawyering. I thought I'd share a nugget from a conversation I had yesterday with my prof, professor, that really resonated with me. He's a full-time lawyer working mostly in corporate M&As, that's mergers and acquisitions, who also teaches university classes. I asked She's him- She's like uni. Uni, yeah. <laughs> uni. <laughs> You're like, She's very Canadian, yeah. Yeah. All right. I asked him whether he likes practicing law. The gist of his answer was that on many days, he absolutely hates it. The way you sometimes hate a really hard workout while you're doing it. But if it weren't for that struggle, he wouldn't love it the way he does. He gets his satisfaction from challenges, the real kind where you often wonder whether you'll even be able to pull it off. I think this is the kind of, quote, crazy that takes someone far in the legal world. He said, if you're the kind of person who wants to clock out at five and be done with it, this probably is not for you. Probably not a hot take, but maybe listeners will find this as enlightening as I did. Well, I mean, simpli <laughs> let's start with the simple idea here, and that is if you want to clock out at five and be done with it, it's probably not for you. That is, that is definitely true. I mean, lawyers work way more than 40 hours a week. They yeah, are or trying... you can be the kind of lawyer who, who works 40 hours a week, but that's not the kind of lawyer who makes money. Yes, that's, that's there true. Are, there are public servants who clock yep. out at 5 o'clock who, yep. um, you know, they're fighting the good fight, but they're not working that hard at it because they have decided that their family and friends are more important and they're just going to clock out at 5 and they don't take it home with them. That's true. Although they probably do think about it at home. I can't imagine that well, these, uh, these cases don't go away from your mind on yeah, some especially level. Especially if you're, you know, representing a child in the foster care dependency system. Yep. You know, like you might have a pretty good schedule, but boy, hard not to take the burden of those kids home with you. And you're yep. not going to make like a super killer salary. Nope. Um, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so that's my first reaction. Um, it's interesting uh, what he says about challenges. There's things he really hates, but he kind of, in, I guess, enjoys it. That that sort of makes sense. You can't, um, <laughs> in some ways, the pleasure you get out of life is dependent on the amount of pain that you have to go through to get it, yeah. too. I mean, that's just like been psychologically... It, it made me think about Cole Black. I mean, that's my like number one lawyer friend that I bring up on every damn show. But I, I went to law school with Nikki, and she is a badass lawyer. And she <laughs> she's working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., kind of at a minimum. Um, and, I mean, she doesn't even move. She's like stone. It's crazy. <laughs> and... Stone at her desk. Yeah, it's it's wild. I mean, she gets up and make microwaves herself a cup of noodles. 
uh, in two minutes and she's back at the desk. Uh, it's, it's crazy. Um, but anyway, she also, she's one of my board game friends and mm -hmm. her favorite thing in the world is like just harder, the better she, we want to lose. We want games that are going to kick our ass hmm. and uh, we play all these co-op games and uh, like, it wouldn't be fun if we didn't lose. Like, yeah, we, sure. we need to be like high-fiving when we actually make it. It's not like we don't want it to be easy. We don't want to expect to win. Yeah. And the other thing that she really likes is she likes unwrapping a... It's like the, her favorite time that she's ever going to play that game is the very first time she plays the game because she's the one that is going to unwrap it and like read the entire damn rule book. Mm -hmm. That's her favorite part of the game hmm. <laughs> is, to, is to solve that novel system. Yeah. And then play the game and lose and then play the game again and lose and then play the game again and lose and then play the game and win high fives. And then she probably never wants to play it again. Yep. Because that is the special kind of crazy that makes like a real badass lawyer. Yeah. So anyway. Cool. Yeah. That's part of it. That's not the only thing, but that's part of it. You need to want to work your ass off and you need to love like, crazy hard challenges that you don't know whether you're going to make it or not. It's not, yeah. it, it's not for the weak hearted. Like <laughs> you, you need that, that just specter of losing and you need to be motivated by that. Okay. Next one. This is from Eric. Uh, also about episode 340. I'm okay. listening to episode 340 of the thinking else that podcast. That was by the way, our last episode. And Nathan just said that we have to make sure that we're running the table at the beginning of each section. This is the first time I've heard this recommendation, and I don't know what it means. Would y'all explain it, perhaps in your next podcast, or can you point me to a video that explains the concept? Ben, what do I mean, and what is the origin of, if you know, if I say you really need to make sure that you're running the table and getting them all right at the beginning of every section, what do I mean by running the table? Well, <laughs> the feeling is, is to... Um, move quickly. Uh, I'm assuming the origin is like pool, but I don't know actually. Yeah, it has nothing to do with moving quickly. So I'm glad we have gotten rid of that. We, we definitely want to slow down and make sure that we're getting every question right. But it does, you're right, Ben, it comes from pool. Um, to run the table means, uh, and you'll see, like if you ever watch pro nine ball players, um, or just watch any pro billiards at all. It's, they're, yeah, yeah. They're, I mean, they're amazing. <laughs> but um, they running to run the table means to make every shot <clears throat> and to win the game without even letting your opponent have a turn. Hmm. Oh, maybe that's <clears throat> what I was thinking by quickly. Like you're not even, you're moving forward. <laughs> I get that's no. not what you're trying to say, but. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I not, didn't think you would have thought that, but that, so that is, I'm glad we got to talk about that. Yeah, but it's a, it comes from pool and you don't have to be fast about it. You just have to calmly, carefully mm. make yeah. every shot. Because if you miss even one, yeah. right? And if that might happen, if you go a little bit too quickly, if you miss even one, then now you have to hand the stick over to the opponent. Yep. Um, yeah. In LSAT terms, <laughs> the LSAT is not going to turn around and then run the table on you. So running the table is a shutout. You're just like, yes. you're not even giving the your opponent the opportunity to play. Right. Yeah. Yep. And so, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say that phrase, but to run the table means to score a whole bunch of unanswered points in any sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can run the table in basketball. You know, you're, done, you're down 10 with two minutes left, but you score the next 12 points in a row you ran the table and won the game. Yeah. Although I like the pool analogy because when you nail a shot in pool, you don't even have to give your opponent the opportunity to participate. Yeah, they don't even touch the ball, right? They don't. Whereas they, in they, basketball, they it's like now you have to defend too, right? right. But yeah. No, yeah. In pool, no, that's the point. Like it's your table. You And you're not under the, the clock, table. as you said, right? You can stand right. there and you can shoot slowly and carefully, but if you nail it, now it's like, okay, your turn again. Yep. Okay. Thanks, Eric, for writing in for the clarification. Cool. 
So this one's from Elijah. Hey guys, the daemon allows me to look up phrases using control F. I find this helpful for reading comp. Will I be able to do that? I, I didn't say that, sorry, Elijah just said that. Um, I, I, will I be able to do that on the official LSAT? I'm expecting the answer to be yes, but since I do it so often, I wanna be 100% sure. Also, does the official LSAT provide those blue highlights when they refer to a specific area of the passage in reading comp? Uh, love the demon in the podcast, by the way. Hopefully my next email to you will be an improvement story. Oh, exclamation point. Thanks, Elijah. Yeah. Okay. So two easy questions. Um, as far as we know, yes, you can use control F on the official LSAT. Um, it's a browser functionality that um, LSAC does not consider a security vulnerability and has not shut down. Um, I, I, I don't really understand the value of doing that, but um, yeah. as far as we know, you can, and you can do that in Law Hub right now, too, to this day. So, it's you, you, you do, Elijah, have access to that feature, but I would encourage you not to use it. I, it's a crutch, and it's just not always going to work. The reason why it's not always going to work, Elijah, is that synonyms are a thing. Not only synonyms, but also just phrases that are, are um, different forms of the exact same word. Yeah. Um, I mean, they can take a word that you're looking for and they can change it enough that it now no longer works for when you look it up in control F or they can just use a synonym. If they use a synonym, you have no shot. If they change the word enough by, by putting it into a different form, I'm trying to think of it. Oh, how about law and legal? You're not finding legal with any kind of a control F for law. You're also not finding law with any kind of a control F for legal. I mean, if he's doing it for a question that specifically quotes. Well, yeah, I'm not saying it's never going to work. Yeah. I'm just saying you got to be careful when you try to deploy that if you are going to. Yeah. And not only that, but I think it's faster to just use your eyes. I mean, I almost always, like, if I've read the passage well enough, then when they're like, you know, where were the reasons why judges should be allowed to do outside research in a trial, I'm like, oh, that was in passage A, and it was boom. And my eyes go, like, right to it. I don't need to control F and copy paste and type in a bunch of shit. I mean, I think you need to get in the habit of reading it better and, and not rely on that control F crutch. That's my take. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I don't think it's great to rely on it, but I don't have a strong opinion about it. I don't think it takes that long to do control F either. But I what just, about when you don't, what about when it doesn't work? Well, I mean, you've got it, but that's, that's the thing. So you obviously should not do use it. it. Yeah. When it's like, you're looking for a quoted word. Yeah. I'm not, it's not something I'd be out there saying, please do this. I well, just like, if someone did it, it's like, okay. I mean, it, it is going to highlight that word instantly for you. If you yeah. know that's the word you're looking for. You've got to be sure that you are, you got to be sure. I mean, I think that most commonly happens with a proper noun. Proper nouns do tend to be capitalized. If, but, it, and, and if you, especially if you're looking for, you know, Picasso in the passage, I don't know, my eye goes right to it. It's just like, yeah. there it was, boom. And okay, yeah, control F is fine. You, you can control F, type Picasso, boom, sure. Let's say it's a tie. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think you're beating me. I mean, in almost every case. And if, if you ever, use this strategy at the wrong time, you're just going to only waste time with it. You're going to control F and come up with nothing. If you ever use it for, oh, I, they used this word, but in fact, they didn't use exactly that word. They only used a form of that word. Then you're going to just fail on it. So anyway, I don't, I, we don't teach it for sure. The blue thing is one of the reasons why, by the way, you don't need it. Yeah, so his second question, does the official LSAT provide those blue highlights? And yes, they do. When we first um, implemented them in the Demon, people actually complained. They're like, oh, this is super helpful. 
it takes me right to the line that they're quoting, but I don't want this help because I want it to be like the official <laughs> test. It's like, we're not doing this <laughs> to make the test any easier. We're simply copying right. what the LSAT is doing. So, Yeah, it's it, right. And it's nice. So this is one example of where the L, I, I need to remember this. This is one example of where the LSAT has gotten easier in recent years, right? Like, why have scores gone up so much recently, Ben? Well, partially because taking it at home is more comfortable, partially because LSAT prep has gotten better, including LSAT demon. I mean, it's like unbelievable how much our yeah. students improve these days. There's many factors maybe, but one of the factors, it's a small thing, but the LSAT used to have line references on it. It'd be yeah. like when the passage said blah, blah, blah in lines 11 through 13, and then you'd have to go scroll and it was on the left-hand side of the lines yeah. You'd have to look for the number and it was only numbered every 10, right? Mm -hmm. So you'd have to go like, okay, 10. Okay. So 11. All right. So 11 to 13. And now instead it shows you in the question, it shows it highlighted in blue. And then in the passage, it's also simultaneously highlighted in blue. Mm -hmm. And so you just boom, go right to the, the particular phrase that they're asking you about. Yeah. So that, that is on the official test. Thanks, Elijah. Yeah. Next Good one. Luck. Yep. Good morning, Ben and Nathan. I've been following your podcasts for a while now, and I'm currently a premium subscriber in The Demon. I went from a cold 153 to an official 166 on the February 22 test. So 13 points of improvement so far from a cold 153, which is a great starting score. Yeah. That's exactly the type of person who, who like, you know, I see that cold 153 and I'm like, we're going to get you into the 170s. We're going to get you to a truly elite law school uh, for free. Yeah. Assuming your GPA is not abysmal. And if your GPA is abysmal, that's okay too. We're going to get you to not an elite school, but a fine school for free. Yeah. And you can still apply to the elite schools, but they're probably going to dismiss you based on your GPA. Let's be honest. Yep. Th this email gets a little rambly, but I kept, I kept it in there just in case we needed the background details. Okay. So Christian then now goes like back in time. I foolishly took the August 2021 test without taking the slow is smooth, smooth is fast approach and bombed out on games terribly and got a 153. So that's exactly the same score as the cold diagnostic. Okay. And, you know, we, we both would just go, yeah, all right, who cares? Who gives a shit? You've got many more attempts at it and law schools yeah. only care about your highest score. So whatever, who cares? I studied with lesser prep programs from February, 2021 to July, 2021 until I switched to the demon. I study at least an hour a day, take practice tests about. So, and I, we should point out here that that's six months solidly, six months of studying and ended up scoring exactly the same as uh, his diagnostic, it's a bummer. which we see all the time. And that doesn't mean we can't help you. We're still going to help you. We're still going to change your life. I study at least an hour a day, take practice tests about every two weeks and work a full-time job as an employment paralegal. I tell you guys this because I am determined to attend law school against all odds. <laughs> okay. I plan to take the June 2022 exam as I believe I will be more than ready to break the 170s. My highest practice test is a 168. Um, I want to make a note here about people with specific plans to take tests on specific dates. Yeah. I really don't think people should be thinking about that. I think instead they should be studying as hard as they can, keeping an eye on the next registration deadline, whenever the next registration deadline is, which as you hear this, the next registration deadline is Wednesday, March 16th, so like two days from when this podcast airs, is a deadline to sign up for the April 2022 LSAT. And so my advice for Christian is, well, why, if, if your practice tests are in the 170s, which could easily happen, right, by the time, between the time Christian sent this and the time this airs, I don't know, like, it's only another few points. Like, why not? potentially take a shot at April. Yeah. And then the flip side of that is if you're still not there when the deadline registration comes around for June, well then you're not there and you shouldn't sign up for June if you're not there. 
But he, for, all, for all we know, he's already signed up for June. I mean, exactly, yeah. which that always makes me uncomfortable because I just don't want you donating money to the law school admission council. I hate it when I hear people say, well, I'm 15 points away from my goal and the test is tomorrow. Should I still take it? And I'm like, what? What? Why did you ever register for that test? Well, even here, he says his highest practice test was a 168. It's okay. Like, fine. You want to break into the 170s? Break into the 170s on some actual tests, practice tests. Yeah, then I, register. And then register. I, I, I do think they need to have an awareness, as you're saying, of, you know, hey, what are the tests that are coming up? It's like, okay, you got June, you got August, you got September. What are the... De- Just so you have a, a vague sense of kind yeah. of what's out there, but... What you're saying is you're not like concretely committing to any of them. You're no. you're just aware of the the milestones yeah. and we, then you're jumping on them when you're ready. This is a benefit of the online LSAT. We used to have to register in advance because when it was back in the old pencil and paper days in person or on the old the tablets that they had for just a couple administrations where you had to borrow a tablet computer from them. Remember that? Yeah, um, Microsoft uh, <laughs> Surface Go. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, back in those days they had a limited number of seats. And if you didn't sign up, then the seats might fill at your local testing center. And then you might get screwed and have to go to Fresno to go take your test, which yeah. uh, nobody wants to go oh, to Fresno. Oh yeah. I kind of remember ever. that now. I forgot about all those right. like, Oh, I got to travel a hundred miles outside of this area. And they're guaranteeing that they'll open a spot within a right. hundred miles. <laughs> no, people would fly like my, I got a cousin who lives in Portland, so I'm going to go stay with her for two days and take the test. It's like, Oh fuck, really, man, that sucks. Yeah. Um, so it, it, that those days are gone though. I mean, now yeah. I haven't heard of a single person not able to register at the deadline. Yep. So you can register at the deadline for the next official test. And we're always going to give you the deadline for the next official test at the top of every thinking else at podcast. So if you can stomach our voices, you could just subscribe to the podcast, listen to it when it comes out, and you'll always know what the next deadline is. Mm -hmm. And that's all you really need to be thinking about is, okay, are my scores where I want them to be right now? And if not, then I'm not going to register. And if they are, then I am going to register. Yep. If your scores are where you want them, then take the fucking test. If your scores aren't where you want them, then don't. Now, there's a bit of a gray area, right? Like five points. Sure. Sure. If you're, if you're sneaking up on it and Christian, you know, maybe is getting close. Okay. If you're sneaking up on it and you feel good about it and you feel like, cause the deadlines are like pretty far ahead, right? Like six weeks ahead. So if you feel like, well, Hey, I'm within five points and I feel like I'm making a lot of progress and I know I've got six weeks until the official test at that point, it can be worth it to just go ahead and register to give yourself the option of taking it. Yeah. But don't take the <clears throat> official test. If your scores aren't where you want them. And if you're 10 points or more away from your goal, then it's wishful thinking to just like magic. What? Oh, magically, I'm going to make that improvement. Maybe you will. But what's the point of donating $200? And losing a test opportunity. And lose it. Right. Well, certainly don't sit for it. I mean, you know, if, if you did register the $200, if you're behind, if you're, if we've passed the registration deadline, you're not getting your money back, but you still mm-hmm. could withdraw. And it's worth thinking about a withdrawal just so you don't waste one of your attempts. Yep. You have to withdraw before the test date, by the way. Yeah. Cancel is not the same as withdrawal. Yeah. Cancel, that counts as one of your attempts and it shows up on your record. Withdrawal doesn't count as an attempt, doesn't show up on your record. Much better to withdraw. But even better than that is just don't register unless you're ready. Yep. And then if you're ready, then take it. Do your best. It's just another practice test. You can always take another one after that. Yeah. But don't, don't, I I don't know. I just, there's people are too focused on like, but my plan was to take it in X. Yeah. I guess we should. I don't care what your plan was. We should clarify one thing here. And that is if you are ready, right. And you do register, um, for say the June test and then the registration deadline for the August, the next test comes up. Uh, you register for that as well, because if yep. you were ready for June, then that means you're ready for August. And we realize that you may knock it out of the park in June, but you yep. don't want the situation where you take it in June and now you've missed the August registration deadline. And so you're taking it again in September, right? So once you yeah. hit that point where you're regist- you're eligible to register, then you start registering. <laughs> 
until but you're man, done. Yeah. I scored really poorly on that official test and I feel like I need more time to prep. Uh, well, <laughs> were you not ready for it or did you just have a bad day? Yeah. Either you shouldn't have taken the first one. Yep. Which don't do that. Mm -hmm. Or you, if you, if your practice test did indicate that you were ready and then I don't care what you, how, what you scored on your one on, you know, it's just one data point. So you had a bad day, whatever you had a bad day. Yeah. You totally choked. Who cares? It's not like you need more prep to recover from the choke. You just need to get back on the horse. Yep. Back to Christian. Again, yep. Christian, cold 153, spun his wheels for a while, six months worth of studying somewhere else, official 153, switched to the demon, highest practice test now, 168, hoping to break into the 170s. I want to go to law school for free. I will apply broadly. I am based in Los Angeles. I have aspirations of big law. I know that my GPA, 3.38, is going to hold me back from the big hitters. <laughs> I edited Christian there and broke those sentence, broke that long yeah. sentence into <laughs> many. You're helping him, yep. Yeah. Write shorter sentences, y'all. Um, anyway, I know that I need to get a, one six, a 174, very specific, to possibly get a full ride to USC and UCLA, though I am fond of Loyola Law and Hastings, <laughs> despite their approximately 17% placement at national firms. And that placement data Christian got from lawschooltransparency.com. Next week, by the way, we're going to have Kyle McEntee, one of the uh, founders of Law School Transparency, back on the podcast. Wait, hold up. <clears throat> Christian, if your goal is to go into big law, then the percentage of students at your school that go to big law firms actually should be of prime importance to you. Yeah. Now, I don't know why you're, at, you're fond of these schools. Why are you fond of them? I know. That's the part where I was like, what? You're fond of Hastings? Oh, my God. I'm an alum of Hastings. I'm not fond of Hastings in the slightest. What made you fond of Hastings? Well, and, and especially it, despite the evidence that might be most important to your specific goals of but going to law school. But Kamala Harris. Kamala okay. Harris went to, Kamala yeah. Harris yeah. Went to Hastings. <laughs> it's like, okay, Kamala Harris. Special story there. Not your story. You're not going to do that. That's not going to be you. I mean... <laughs> It's like, also, that was a long time ago. That was before Hastings was as ridiculously expensive as it is. Yeah. Um, that 17%, I, I will, I, you know, it's not like if Christian goes to Hastings, Christian has a 17% chance because presumably Christian is only going to go to a school like Hastings on a full ride. Right. So what are, how many Hastings students are getting a full ride? If, he, if Christian is one of those people who's there on a full ride, then that means that Christian is probably better equipped to do the competition that's going to be required at Hastings, which I promise you is intense. Still, I mean, <laughs> uh, well, if you look at UCLA, right, like the national law firms is 47%. It's just, it's just astronomically higher, yeah. plus federal clerkships of another 4.8%. So you add those together, you're looking at 50, what, 2%? Yeah. You're do not pay for law school, Christian. I mean, that, that much is clear. Do not pay for any of these schools because it's risky even at USC, UCLA. You are not like printing your ticket to success in big law by going to USC and UCLA. Even if you do get that first job in big law, you're still like 50-50 to wash out after a year or two or get laid off. <laughs> we talked about this a little bit on the last show, but the... Uh, odds of a recession are like looking better and better. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, for many reasons. And like the lawyers are gonna go like <laughs> big law is not shy about laying people off. And so, you know, if you go to one of these schools thinking you're going to just like waltz into big law, that is never going to be the case. And it's especially not going to be the case if you're graduating in the aftermath of some recession where a whole bunch of lawyers got laid off First, you're going to be competing with people who have actual legal experience trying to get that same job as you. 2008 wasn't that long ago. 
Mm-mm. 2008, well, the lawyers didn't get chopped until like 2010. But when the, the lawyers... Yeah, the legal economy is always trailing like... for, right. And I can't remember why this is, but the legal economy is trailing like two to three years. People each other yep, over behind. stuff. Law, law firms move slowly. Lots of reasons. You know, the deals are still in progress, whatever. The, the, point, the point is the lawyers, yeah, the, the law economy tends to trail the real economy. And Which so, means it it lasts yeah. longer, but it also then takes longer to reboot, right? Right. So bad news for you if you're listening to this now and you're planning to graduate from law school in 2026. You know, in 2022, we're looking at the teeth of like potentially a bad recession. Stock markets already started to crash. Inflation is a thing. We got Putin doing wild shit in Europe. It's not good. <laughs> it's like the bad times, you know? And um, anyway, 2010, if you graduated, I graduated from law school in 2011. If you graduated from law school in 2011, your odds of going right into big law were bad. There were people applying for secretary jobs, like receptionists. People applying to the receptionist job at a big law firm with JDs on their resume. Yikes. That was only 10 years ago. Well, and baristas and all that. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, no, I'm talking, but I mean, this is people who were like, hadn't yet given up on their dream of being a lawyer. Yeah. They were like, no, no, I, I understand that I'm going to have to seriously humble myself by getting a receptionist job, even though I've already spent a quarter of a million dollars and three years of my life on law school and another six months of my life on the bar exam. I mean, these are like barred attorneys <laughs> who are applying and they just, they, there's no way they're going to get that, that lawyer job because yeah. the firms aren't even hiring lawyers. And if they <clears throat> were going to hire lawyers, they're going to hire their experienced associates that they just laid off people that they already know and trained. Yeah. I mean, it's bad. It's real bad. So like, <clears throat> That 17% that Loyola and Hastings boast right now, I had to put the scare quotes around boast. Um, the 17% that those schools have now for big law placement ain't no guarantee that it's going to be that good in 2026. Yeah. Anyway, Christian thinks he needs a 174 for a possible full ride at USC and UCLA. And that would be nice. I just want to know your opinion on, Pulling out direct loans for the cost of survival in law school. I am trying to minimize my debt exposure. I currently sit on $34,000 in debt after Santa Clara and the UCLA extension paralegal program. Take out as little debt as you possibly can. I mean, this is why we're saying to go for free so you can minimize that debt. You obviously still have to live I would just figure out what expenses you absolutely need and figure out if there's a way you can avoid loans. If you can't live at home, if you can yeah, work while you're in law school, if you can live with your parents, do not buy fancy suits. Do not drive fancy cars. Borrow as little as you possibly can. Every dollar you save today is like $10 <laughs> 10 Don't, years from now. Yeah, maybe it's not that extreme, but well, as inflation, well, actually inflation helps because you're going to be makes paying your money back cheaper, loans but with in, I don't know if it, I don't know if it's crazy. I mean, cuz I think what ends up happening is it reflects a it, it changes the way you interact with the world, right? To the extent you can, can like limit yourself, the easier that becomes to the extent you don't limit yourself, you just give in. It's like you start giving in everywhere. So it's like yeah, $1 multiplies. I don't well, know. it's like you eat the one cookie. Yep. And then you're like, ah, fuck it. And you just eat the whole plate of cookies. That does have a way of happening, especially because there is no limit on how much you can borrow f- for education. Yeah. It's foolishly. That's a very bad system we have. There needs to be a cap on tuitions. Like the government needs to stop guaranteeing these loans, law schools, I mean, USC should not be able to charge $80,000 a year for their tuition. Not if, not if people are borrowing the money. Yeah. No way. It's just not, that's not <laughs> what planet are you living on that that's going to actually be worth it. So, you know, just 
Christian, my opinion on pulling out direct loans for the cost of survival in law school, I assume you're only talking about living expenses, definitely not talking about paying tuition. Uh, do not do that to pay tuition. Well, it just it, if you're if you're debating how much to take out just to live, <clears throat> you start to realize how much a difference it even makes, you know, to take out 20,000 versus 30 30,000, right? <laughs> and it's like, why would you even consider taking out money for something that's 60,000 a year? Right? It's just yeah, like yeah. you just realize how easy it is right. to avoid that expense uh, when you start jumping through, you have to jump through hoops to try to minimize your other expenses. Live at home, live with mom and dad, let mom and dad feed you. Mm, that's another big thing. Food's expensive. It's also time consuming. Well, if you yeah, can live with family that's cooking, you. oh my gosh, that's just a help. <laughs> Take your lunch to school, ride the bus, sell your car. I mean, I'm serious. Like, do not, do not impoverish yourself. <laughs> You've already got $34,000 in debt. Yep. Like you need to try to keep this, stop the bleeding. So just, yeah, borrow as little as possible. Anyway, Christian continues. I want to know your opinion on being financially constrained in a certain geographical region. I feel that I may have to pull out loans if I leave the area to attend law school. And that includes even these regional schools, as I think proximity to the law library will be crucial from what I hear from my friends that are in law school. Additionally, is it better to be a big fish in a small pond or a big fish amongst other big fish at a higher ranked school? All right. Okay. Sorry. That's two questions at once. Proximity to the law library. Come on. What? Not anymore. No, it's all, like so many things are online. I, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, Christian's oh. thinking if I go to Hastings, I'm going to have to live in downtown San Francisco. Yeah. No, no, not, no, not don't. well, everything is like. <laughs> What do you have to pay for that? What What are you giving up to get that? Sure, I would like it if you could be closer to school and just it's easier for you to find a quiet place to study. But Bullshit. at what cost? Don't care. Yeah, I had 14 hours of class when I was at Hastings. 14 hours a week. Yeah. Many days where I didn't have any class at all. Or if I did have class, I had one hour. The BART station go, is at Civic Center. It's a block and a half. You're going to step over a bunch of homeless people. It's very sad. It's very gross, the surrounding area in the Tenderloin where Hastings is. And I'm a city guy. I love cities. I'm not judging. There's really good food around there. Go to Toulon. It's on 6th Street. It's disgusting to get there, but the Vietnamese food is killer. But you don't need to live there, dude. <laughs> you don't need to compete with Twitter bros for nice apartments in downtown San Francisco just so you can be closer to the law library. Bullshit. Live in Hayward, ride the BART, read on the BART, <laughs> borrow as little as possible. I'm sure the same is true for Loyola. There's no way you need to live in downtown Los Angeles. And anyway, live with your family. <laughs> Go, where do your mom and dad live? That's where you should live. Big fish in a small pond or a big fish amongst other big fish at a higher ranked school? That's a pretty easy question to answer, right? You got to look at the big law placement of the school you're thinking about going to and then you've got to do the math on like, what are your odds of competing? I mean, do you have a higher chance of being in the top 50% at UCLA or do you have a higher chance of being in the top 17% at Hastings? Yep. That's what I it comes know. down to. And that, that sort of depends on your numbers compared to the numbers in the class. And this is yeah, one thing like, we plan to add to the uh, estimator actually. Okay. Just like it. Yeah. It will be easier to do well at a lower ranked school, but the big law placement will be lower at a lower ranked school. And I can't make, I'm not going to give you like a hard and fast. <laughs> it's not a simple answer. I don't know. There is merit to being a big fish in a small pond. It's easier to get A's on your exams. There's also merit to being in a bigger pond because Especially if most of that or more of that pond is getting picked yeah. up. Yeah. Well, so like that's what you have what, to figure how out. How big of a pond are we talking about? I, I mean, if we're talking about literally actual Stanford, yep. which we're not talking about because you have a 3.38. But if we were talking about Stanford, at Stanford, 100% of the class can get a big law job if they want it. Or, or 98% or something crazy like that. Yeah. It, it, I'm pretty sure it's 100% if they wanted it. 
Like I, I can yeah. <laughs> show me a Stanford law grad who is like not able to do what they want. I, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't think that's a thing. So at Stanford, yes, you can actually print your ticket, but not at Berkeley and certainly not at UCLA or USC and God no at a school like Loyola or Hastings. I mean, when you get to those schools, the vast majority of people can't do whatever they want. I'm not saying don't go to those schools. If that's the best school you can go to for free, then that's probably the school you should go to. You should probably just go to the best school you can go to for free. That's the, that's the easiest. I mean, yeah, if you're no, I mean that, and that is simple, Christian, you've named four schools, Loyola, Hastings, USC, UCLA, probably in ascending order of big law placement. Maybe Loyola and Hastings are the same, but you see USC is slightly shittier than UCLA. And if the best law school you can go to for free is Loyola, then you should go to Loyola. But if you can go to USC for free, that's a big jump up. You should go to USC. Yeah. And if you can go to UCLA for free, then you should definitely go to UCLA for free. Also, what about Irvine? What about um, Southwestern? What about, there's lots of other law schools that you're not naming here. Um, if you're going to open it up to the Bay Area, then you need to apply to University of San Francisco, Golden Gate, Santa Clara, probably UC Davis, Berkeley for sure. I mean, you, you need to be like, sounds like you want to practice in California. You need to probably blanket all the California law schools and then just go to the best one that will give you a full ride. All right, next. Yeah, this is from Jared. Hey, Ben and Nathan, my name is Jared. I'm a fifth year senior graduating in May from my undergrad and graduating with my MBA in the fall thanks to an accelerated program my school offers. Mm. Okay. I have an MBA. <laughs> What's done is done. <laughs> it's like, I again, it's like, well, what did I learn of value? I don't know, not that much. Like, it's... I don't, okay. I, I just, hopefully you didn't spend too much money on that. By the way, this is a tangent, but I have been thinking about how expensive education has become. And this is not just a law school problem. This is a problem right throughout education, right? What it's, yeah. it's three times more expensive for education today than it was in the eighties in terms of adjusted for inflation, right? Adjusted for inflation. And I was thinking there's all these things like the demon, but just like throughout the world, right? Audible, that accomplish the same goal as education. They teach people things. I'm kind of waiting for like a revolution to happen and people to just say, forget it. Oh, we're, for sure. For we're sure, done for with sure. education. No. The higher education well, is way overpriced. We're going to do value. a different type of education. I got a buddy yeah. right now. He's my age, roughly. He went to UC Davis. He studied environmental science. He ended up Shocker. I'm going to do shocker. He ended up not being an environmental scientist <laughs> with his bachelor's in environmental science. It was a BS. Yeah. Davis is a good school, but he didn't end up doing what his bachelor's degree, you know, allegedly minted him to do. Yeah. He's wanting to do other stuff. And now at age 40, whatever, he's going back to the Google data analytics program. Have we talked yep. about this already on yeah, the show? Yeah, yeah, yep. Mm -hmm. It's like a six-month program. It costs like 500 bucks. Well, <clears throat> it's way cheaper. It's targeted and practical, right? And you learn way faster because it's like yeah. someone It's someone like us who's like, how do you teach this? How do you teach it effectively? I mean, as you were just saying, <laughs> I, I did get value out of law school, but it was, it was so small, and you could get all that in a book. And probably yeah. much more en entertainingly, right? And, and yeah. for fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars. Like yeah. the comparison I mean, is so dramatically different. That when is education just going like, to die? Imagine this: I want to go into management at Google. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Should I do you, an MBA? An MBA for tens but of thousands no, but of dollars. Ben, it's an MBA at Santa Clara. It's a good yeah. school. It's right in the Silicon Valley. Yeah. Uh, but I, you know, should I do an MBA at Santa Clara? It costs $85,000 a year. Should I do that? Or should I do the Google data analytics program, which yeah. is a $90 a month subscription <laughs> to Coursera and a six month program? Yeah. Made a pro education program designed by Google. Which one should I do? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. And like Khan Academy, all these kinds of things. Yeah are just better. So anyways, 
Um, <laughs> back to Jared. He said yeah. he's going to get his MBA in the fall. I'm currently planning to take the LSAT in both June and August, and I'm hoping to apply to schools in the 60 to 40 range for the fall like of rank 60th to 40th, I guess. Oh, okay. I've recently started studying with the free version of the Demon and planned on purchasing the premium package soon since seeing my scores jump by almost 10 points in two weeks. Okay, nice. From the free version. Okay. Good. Yeah, great. My question is this. Despite a 4.0 major GPA, along with stellar a stellar graduate GPA and a 165 LSAT, would a cumulative GPA of 3.74 hurt my prospects of a full ride? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. So Jared says he's trying to apply to schools in the 60 to 40 range. Fine. People do this shit all the time. They like decide things way before they need to be deciding them. I just don't understand. He has a 3.74. Yeah, right. that's that's not... <laughs> great for the top three that's good you're probably gonna it's probably gonna keep you out of the top three but full ride to university of florida ranked 21 in the country full ride to alabama ranked 26th in the country full ride to byu university of illinois university of iowa university of wisconsin and then boy by the time we get to 40 they're like almost all of them are gonna let you go for free with a 3.74 and a 170 I just don't, it's like, where did, is this, um, the 165 LSAT, is this something that he already took? It sounds like that's a score he has on record, but he's still studying, so that's going to even go up. I don't know. It just doesn't even oh. seem like an applicant who, um, if you go above, like, why are you settling with a 165? Yeah, totally. Like, there, none, none of this makes sense. You could go to Iowa for free. Yeah. Uh, by the way, lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. You could go to Arizona for free. You, I mean, and boy, I didn't check the URM box for Christian. Uh, I don't know the URM Jared. status there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. We're not on, we're not on Christian anymore. My bad. We're on Jared. Um, so I don't know what that is, but I don't know. A lot of irrelevant shit here, right? MBA, totally irrelevant. Your plan for when you want to take the LSAT, totally irrelevant. Um, your major GPA totally irrelevant. A what three about the rest points. Of this stuff? Well, I, bottom line, will my three point seven four hurt my prospects? It's like no, that's a great GPA. Just make sure you get <laughs> yeah. an LSAT score that goes along with it. Your one sixty five will hurt your prospects. Yeah, that's better. what's holding you back. So stop yeah. worrying about your GPA. I had a year before, this is where he continues, I had a year where I decided to pursue a double major in music, a field that was totally out of my comfort zone. And it drastically affected my GPA and sent me back a year as well as well due to the credit load. Yeah, and seeing like all, how many excuses, dude? Anyway, it, don't, who cares? Don't worry, doesn't uh, matter. You still have a yeah. 3.74, which is great. Yeah. I went from having a 4.0 to a 3.74 and then to top it all off, I had to drop the major because of the effects the pandemic had on my university's program. Stop, stop talking about any of this. Yeah. There, it's, it's in the past. It's done. It's over. Yep. I'm sorry you went from a 4.0. That's a bummer. Um, but a 3.74 is still great. Just make yeah, sure you get the LSAT score. Yeah, control the shit that you can actually control. Mm -hmm. The shit you can actually control is your LSAT. You, you need to you, like do better than 165. I mean, yep. I, maybe that's his like current goal score. He says he's planning to take the LSAT in both June and August. W whatever, dude. Maybe you're not going to make it to a 170 by then, but a 170 is going to open up some doors that a 165 is not. And, and a 173 and you, would open up doors that a 170 won't. A lot of doors that are closed to other people already because they have below a 3.74. Right. Your 3.74 is still keeping the door open at... The vast, vast majority of schools. Yeah. I, it's all this other stuff, you know, like people want to, they want to like, but I have an MBA though. And I got good grades in the MBA. Don't care. DNZ doesn't give a shit. Like, it's the LSAT and GPA that she's going to have to report Undergrad. on her 509. Yep. Ugpa. Undergraduate, <laughs> undergraduate GPA and your LSAT score. Those are the things that she thinks predict your success in law school. And they also affect her rankings. 
You know, she said Ugpa, and I, we thought that was kind of funny. It sounds funny, too. But maybe we, we need, need to, to start saying it, say it yeah. because it, it, totally. it emphasizes what actually matters. It's Ugpa, not your GPA. Not yeah. Ugpa. <laughs> Gupa. Don't give a yeah. fuck. Like, your graduate degree grades, whatever. That was a vanity MBA. Don't care. Yeah. Just yeah. Nobody cares. It really, like nobody cares what your grades were in grad school. Grad school yep. is almost always these master's programs. Trust me, I have two of them. Master's degrees are vanity degrees. You, It's hard not to get A's. Yep. Even I get A's in fucking grad school. Come on. Not in law school. That's different. But grad school, even I get A's. Yeah. And so your good grades in your, in, in your, in your master's are not, they don't care. <laughs> Dean Z doesn't care. She cares about UGPA specifically. She says it every fucking time she says GPA. Yeah. She does not say GPA. She says UGPA. Yeah. Undergraduate GPA is what she cares about because that's the public data. Yep. All right. Jared, you can do this, dude. I don't care about your plan to take it in June and August. I care about your practice test scores right now and whether you should register for the upcoming LSAT. That's all I'm ever going to care about. If your practice tests are not where you want them by June, don't register for June. If your practice tests aren't where you want them by the registration deadline for August, then don't register for August. Wait until your practice tests are going to give you a full ride to the school you actually want to go to. Then register for the official LSAT. I would just also reframe your perspective on this whole process. You're, you're like underselling yourself, I yep. think. You're totally. saying, hey, I, I, I'm going to go to a school in the 60 to 4 range. I don't see no. why you couldn't go into the top top 10. Just do the work that's required to get the LSAT. You need to do that. And yeah, then top you, 10. Let's see. So what if Jared gets a 174? That's okay. going to be 99th percentile, right? 3.74 and a 174. I'm yep. at lsatdemon.com slash scholarships. Yeah, I still don't think he, I don't think he's even in the top 14. But Wash U in St. Louis, 18th in the country, full ride. So 374. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, like, yeah, dude, you're probably not going to the truly elite schools, but there are better schools that you could go to. I'm seeing 21, Florida, full ride. 26, Alabama, full ride. 28, Georgia, full ride. Well, here, 30, just BYU, one, thing to keep, ride. one thing to keep in mind is what did you put? You put 174, right? So mm -hmm. small change, but if you do 175, 175 <laughs> yeah. now you're at U UCLA, full tuition, possibly. Right. That's top 14. Yeah. What's it take to get us into so that one point at a time here? 176 doesn't do it. No. Maybe it's 177 maybe. doesn't do it. Keep in mind, you're getting admitted to these schools. It. We're not saying you're not admitted. You're just not going for free. So for us, that's as good as not getting admitted. 179, you've got more than half at several top 10 schools. But yeah, yeah we're not we're not seeing any green even with a 180. It's because your grades are going to be below their twenty, below their fiftieth percentile. Dean Z yeah. is going to be like, eh, "Sorry, dude, you're lowering yeah. my public profile for my GPA, and um, I'll admit you, of course, and I'll give you some tuition." Where does Dean Z start giving more than half? Let's find that out. By the way, this is an estimate, but it's pretty fucking accurate. LSATdemon.com/scholarships. With uh, the one seventy-five, Dean Z is like, "Nope, less than half." With a 176, mm, sorry. Seven, sorry. Eight, <laughs> sorry. It's going to take the 179. Yeah, 179 is where that gets Dean Z mm. oh, to, the one, to, to the more than half. Now, of course, people are going to be like, that's not the analysis that Dean Z does. And if Dean Z herself hears this, I'm not, I don't mean you specifically, Dean Z. I, I mean all of your other competitors out there in the law school market. Um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not specifically right about you, even though I'm using your name. I am certainly right in broader terms. If if an applicant like uh, our guy Jared, if he applies broadly, then this advice is sound. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Next one. Yeah, let's do it. Hi, Ben and Nathan. You often say how this test is understandable even without studying. I put that to the test while answering ask button requests this past weekend. Oh, this is coming from uh, our man Dylan, who uh, ha is a part of the Demon team, and yep. he's specifically been writing a bunch of uh, explanations for ask button requests. 
So here's what Dylan says about our idea that the test is understandable even without studying. He's okay. uh, sitting there responding to student questions. We have an ask yep. button on every page, by the way. If you want help, um, you can email Dylan. And That's even Abigail with the free account. Team, <laughs> even with a free account, you can get free help. LSATdemon.com, uh, please sign up for a free account. Anyway, so Dylan says... Whenever I would answer a question from someone who overcomplicated the passage using the formulaic LSAT dogma that other companies teach, I showed the question to my girlfriend. My girlfriend has neither studied for the LSAT nor taken a class that covered logic. Without fail, she would get the question right in a reasonable amount of time using her innate reading and reasoning abilities. Some of them even had five out of five difficulty ratings. One of the most common things I write to students when I'm answering ask button requests is reread this passage the way you would have read it before you ever started studying for the LSAT. All of this may seem obvious to students who are well versed in our approach, but even I was surprised at just how easy my girlfriend made it look. That's uh, again, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan, for writing in. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I mean, just reset, why, like, right? Clear the mind. Read it, try to understand oh, it, Jesus. and then see what, see what happens. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's not just for reading comp, but also for logical reasoning and for the games too. I had yeah. a poor student in class. You're going to encounter her sometime soon. She's going to get there. I know she's going to get there. But there's a student in my class on Tuesday night who was like, I've been at this for 18 months. I've had private tutoring. I did, I think she said she did LSAT Max or some other thing. 18 months and I've made no progress and it's like harder now than it was when I started. And I'm like, okay, step one, just fucking forget all, everything you've learned. Like, and, and I saw her diagram, right? She yeah. shared her diagram with me. Yep. I'm like looking at her actual logical reasoning diagram or her actual logic games diagram. And I'm like, wherever you got that, just fucking forget about it. Like it is not common sense. All, none of the stuff you're doing is common sense and it's actually wrong. Like you studied these methods of diagramming yeah. and you're trying to do them, but as you do them, you're misrepresenting the actual fucking rules. Yeah. <laughs> like you don't need to do it that way. What you need to do is stop making mistakes. Yep. Read it more carefully. What's it say? And then figure that shit out. But I promise you, like Dylan's girlfriend, you can figure it out by just being careful. So we do need to kind of break people down all the way back to the basics sometimes and just say, <laughs> that's not what that said. That's just not what it says. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, when you're missing a question on reading comp, that's because that's not what the passage said. Or, I mean, and or, like you're misreading the question you're misreading the wrong answer that you picked. You're misreading the right answer that you didn't pick. <laughs> You're not doing a very good job of reading and comprehending is what yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Okay. Next one. Yep. Uh, this is from Carlton. Hi, Ben and Nathan. I have a question about how URM status, that's underrepresented minority status, impacts scholarship considerations. I plan to apply this upcoming cycle, and I've been playing around with the scholarship estimator to get a sense of my options. <clears throat> okay, this is at lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships. I have a 3.97 GPA, awesome, oh. by the way, nice work, and a 170 LSAT. I am an un underrepresented minority, African-American oh. male, if I input those stats into the scholarship estimator, I see full tuition offers at nearly every school ranked lower than Columbia. Yep. Law school is ranked fifth and below. However, yep. when I uncheck the URM box, the scholarship estimator predicts that the highest ranked school to offer me a full tuition or full tuition and stipend would be the University of Southern California, USC, yep. which is ranked 19th. Does the URM status make this great this great of an impact on scholarship offers? How does the scholarship estimator account for URM status? Does it simply add points to our URM's LSAT score? Let, maybe let's stop here and, and answer these questions. Let me say this. First, what the estimator does if you check the URM box is it adds three LSAT points 
to your LSAT score. So in this case, you have a 170. It's now treating you as someone who has a 173. Okay. And it adds 0.2 points to your GPA. So you have a 3.97. That would technically put it over a 4.0. But yeah, I don't actually know what it does there. Maybe it does put it over a 4.0. In any case, that's what we're doing. It's that simple. Um, it's just an estimate. We know that. Okay. Yeah. So, to be clear, this is public information. We we po this is posted. Absolutely. Yeah. That's okay, right. So, so it, when you go to the scholarship estimator, there's a button that says "Learn More," and it tells you the formulas. Oh, uh, I see. It's kind of small. Um, so. I'm, it's a, I see it in a browser on a desktop. Um, it's in the very top right corner. Yep. I see a button that says learn more and it shows you our whole methodology. Yep. Here, here's the thing. We are estimating. All we're trying to do is get as close as we can to the truth. Yep. We're going to constantly have to change this because we get new data every year from the law schools on admissions. Um, that's their LSAT GPA ranges. It's also their scholarship ranges. Yep. And that learn more button gives you our whole secret sauce. Yeah. Because we're trying, all we're trying to do is like, we're trying to help you make sense of the very confusing public data. <laughs> Cause if you yep. had 200 509 reports, it's going to be yep. like a pain in the ass. Yep. Um, so we're open to changing that. If you think that that's wrong, uh, if your admissions case, if your results like vary wildly from what the estimator spits out, we want to know about it. Yep. Cause we're trying, we're constantly trying to tweak this thing and make it as good as we can. Um, how would people email help at lsatdemon.com? That's all, yeah. Just do that or help at thinking lsat.com. We'll, we'll get it to the right people. I mean, you should email help at lsatdemon.com honestly, cause emailing me, I'm not the guy to email. <laughs> all I'm going to do is pass that along to the team. So, um, Email help at lsatdemon.com if you have feedback or questions or whatever about the scholarship estimator. But we're all we're trying to do, Carlton, is represent what we think is the truth. And we hear, boy, 10 to 1, people telling us that the estimator was really accurate yep. um, for their own personal ad admissions decisions. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and, and we're not perfect. I mean, it's an estimator. It's not a calculator. Like don't go show this to Dean Z and say, but it says here that I'm getting a full, like, that's not how this is going to work. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's meant to give you an idea of what kinds of offers you might be able to get from what kinds of schools so that you can decide like where to apply basically. Yeah. Based on okay. last year's data. So, you know, we're always a year behind. So but... it adds 0.2 to GPA and 0.3, oh, sorry. And three LSAT points. Um, yep. that's a pretty significant boost. It is a I significant confirm, boost too, but yeah, go ahead. Well, I confirmed that. Yeah. I mean, 3.97 and a 170 with a URM, I think that that is going to get you. And this, it's just like, it fits with reality to me. It fits with my actual 15 years of experience in law school or yeah. in law school helping like applicants. Um, yeah, I, I would think that you should get multiple full rides uh, from top 10 schools as a URM with a 3.97 and a 170. When I uncheck the box, I see no full ride offers to top 10 schools. I still see some more than half, but I don't see any full rides. And that doesn't surprise me at all because there are lots of white and Asian applicants with 3.97 and a 170. There aren't as many URM applicants with a 3.97 and a 170. Law schools do have to publish their um, race and ethnicity on their 509 reports. And they are worried about that shit because law schools look fucking racist if you just look at the race and ethnicity. Yeah. You know, so they're trying to make themselves unracist and they have to compete, you know, even more for the top. Uh, black and Latinx applicants because they just don't have as many people with numbers that look like that. It's harder to find people with those kinds of numbers who look like you and they want their law school to look more like America. So yeah, it's like you get a boost. Yeah. I mean, how racist are these schools? I, I don't like, let me look at university of Chicago law school. That's looking like the best school right now that would offer, we think that would offer Carlton a full ride. How racist I don't know are if you? Chicago? Racist is the right term. I, I do. I, I, I do. 
Um, Why? Like, because, uh, I, and I don't mean intentionally racist. I just mean, in fact, they have a program that does not look like, I, I, I don't know yet because I haven't looked at their form yet, but I mean, I'm pretty sure that their form does not look like America. That's all I'm saying. So let's see. Of 213 JDs that this school awarded last year, um, yeah, you know, 125 of them were white, 25 of them were Asian. They graduated 10 black or African Americans out of a class of 213. They graduated 33 Hispanics of any race out of a class of 213. It's just like blacks and Hispanics of any race are dramatically unrepresented at this school. I'm not okay. saying that I'm not saying that they discriminate against people on the basis of race. But they do in fact discriminate against people on the basis of race via LSAT and GPA and many other things. Well, you also have to look at the number. I mean, does the problem, I don't know, when you say a school is racist, it's like, how much is it a contributor versus how much is is it a product of the system it's a part of? Because how many... I'm not saying they invented the system. I am saying that their admissions procedure, in fact, discriminates against people of color. Scoreboard, dude, you can't argue with the scoreboard. (laughs) There are far more Hispanics in the country than 33 out of 213. There are far more blacks and African Americans in the country than 10 out of 213. Whatever they do to arrive at their admissions decisions, and I'm sure that they, what they really do is they give a boost to these people. They do, they give a boost to people of color. Nonetheless, it is an inherently racist applications procedure to law school. And, and that's because our whole system is just racist. Like it's just, it's like the whole fucking thing. It, 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 it just in fact discriminates against people of color. Yeah. For I mean, many, I'm not saying many, there's many not problems. I just don't know where the source of the problem is. Right. Yeah. Exactly. No, but so that's the schools are trying to fix it. They're doing their best while being part of a, an inherently racist system. And it's good that they're doing something about it. I mean, I, like, I, I have, as a white male, I have certainly never felt discriminated against by the fact that schools give a boost in admissions to uh, blacks and uh, Hispanics or Latinx or whatever we're going to call people who don't look like me. I, you know, I, God, boy, I have like no patience whatsoever for that. Like yeah. you're hearing white dudes be like, oh, it's, it's not fair. Fuck you. <laughs> the whole system is so set up in your favor. Yeah. You have a higher LSAT and a higher GPA because of the virtue of being in being a white male. <laughs> like the whole system, the deck was stacked in your favor when you were born. And, and, and I say that even as somebody whose parents didn't go to college. My, my folks, my, my family, my grandpa had a fourth grade education. Like my, they were literally agricultural laborers coming out of the Dust Bowl two generations before me, but I still recognize that the deck has always been stacked in my favor. You know? Okay. So anyway, um, want to go back to Carlton's email? Absolutely. I'm also curious to know how you guys think URM status impacts admissions at high ranked schools. With a 170 LSAT, I am below the median LSAT score for most T14 schools. It seems strange that the scholarship estimator predicts that U Chicago would give me full tuition, considering that my LSAT score is two points below their median, 172. How large of a boost does URM status provide in the law school admissions process? That we don't know for sure. <clears throat> we know it's not as big as some people think. I still remember early, early on in the podcast when we watched that uh, video by the dean from UVA. Do you remember that video? Yep. That and was in like that, episode six. That was like way yeah. back there. Yeah. Yeah. So in that, I, I'm pretty sure this is where I got that number. He said, look, um, we're, if you're a URM, we're going we're gonna to admit you with lower scores, but not so low that we end up bringing you into a situation that you can't succeed in. And I, I thought the number he said was five points. So he said, look... 
more than a five point difference, I, yeah. I can't admit you to UVA. Yeah. I, and his rationale was you're, he was just bringing people on to fail. Well, that's he, the first thing Dean Z talked about when she talked about why she cares about LSAT and UGPA, right? Yeah. This was just a few episodes ago that we watched this video on YouTube from Dean Z, University of Michigan Law. And she was explaining like, well, LSAT and GPA independently predict your performance in my law school. Together, they account for 50% of 1L grades at my actual law school. So yeah, like if your LSAT is 10 points below, then Dean Z is going to be like, oh shit, like I'm worried that you're going to struggle here. Not only that, but it also lowers the other reason why she cares about these things is because they're part of her 509 data that she has to report to the world and it will lower her rank. Dean Z does not want to fall out of the top 14 law schools. Well, there's that side of it, but also, yeah, she's, as you're saying, worried about how the student will do at the school, right? And yeah, so, it's, two, it's two separate reasons. Yeah. So your, your point is, well, well, so for that, for the first reason, the yeah. reason that, like, I mean, because let's be honest, like, if you're 10 points below, you're going to have a hard fucking time. There's a good chance you could fail out, and they've really just, they've just, they haven't helped you. They've really hurt you so Set you up to fail, yeah. Yeah. They're not going to do that. Carlton. They're, they're not trying to set you up to fail. That's guaranteed. So School the number like Chicago, if they admit yeah. you, they admit you because you're a badass. So the number he said in that video, I'm pretty sure it was five points. He wouldn't go beyond five points. Um, and he was responding to, I guess, unfortunately, some URMs that he talked to were under the impression that, hey, you know, the, the help could be as significant as 10 points. He's like, look, I, I that's false. So don't think that you can apply to a school that's 10 points out of your range. Maybe five. The estimator is saying, let's conservatively go with three. That could still be too high. Three points makes a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they looking, I'm, I'm, not, I'm on the Chicago 509, right? This is a school that is uh, ranked fourth in the country. Sorry, fifth in the country. And I picked them out because they look like they're the first school that's going to give a scholarship to a URM with a 3.97 and a 170. Their 50th percentile LSAT is 172. So, you know, like you're only two points below their median anyway, Carlton, with a 170. I mean, 170 is a pretty badass LSAT score. And their 25th percentile is a 169. So a full quarter of the class has a lower LSAT than you do. You have truly excellent grades. Not, not up to their 75th percentile, by the way, but almost knocking on the door of their 75th percentile grades. So truly excellent grades, a pretty kick-ass LSAT score. They look at you and they go, this guy can compete here. He's not going to lower our public data too much. I mean, he's below our median LSAT. That sucks. But he's above our median GPA. That's great. And he's a URM. He's an African-American. Our fucking 509. I mean, look at that number, Ben. 10. What if that number was nine? Yeah. It's like, what? I mean, it just, they are, and, and I, I don't, I don't mean this cynically at all. I, they are genuinely interested in diversifying their schools as they should be for many, many good reasons. You hear this on like business podcasts all the time. How do you build a good team? How do you build a, a team that doesn't make shitty decisions? Diversity is a really good way to do that. And so, you know, they they like they they consider you an asset to their program for many reasons. And so, yeah, they're going to give you a boost. Cool. He continues, I'm a huge fan of the podcast and the demon after I spent 3 unproductive months studying with Kaplan. The Demon increased my LSAT score by nine points in just two months. I recommend The Demon to everyone I know who's applying to law school. Many thanks. Carlton. Keep in touch, Carlton. Can't wait to hear how this uh, turns out for you. 170? I don't know if that's like Carlton's highest. <laughs> We're always encouraging people to get greedy, right? Yeah. It's like, is 170 the best you could do? I mean, you are going to get some pretty badass offers with a 3.97 and a 170. 
if you wanted to tap out and declare victory, that's fine. But what if you could get a 99th percentile LSAT? That might end up getting a full ride to Columbia, which you, the estimator didn't show previously. Depends where you want to live. Depends what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, you are going to have many good offers, Carlton, as you should, because you are a truly excellent applicant. Um, the URM thing is a kind of a cherry on the cake. <laughs> I mean, it's just going to like, that's going to make you, there just aren't that no, many people I, that look like Carlton. They, I was they, laughing at your analogy as opposed to your point. <laughs> <laughs> a cherry on a cake doesn't sound that appealing to me. I would say icing <laughs> on a cake. <laughs> well, yeah, wait, cherry on a, what? Cherry on the Sunday? And that's like, yeah, I, I think that's what, what I meant it, to yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. I, as I was saying it, I was like, what? <laughs> cherry on a pie? I don't know. All right. <laughs> Good job, Carlton. Thanks for writing in. All right, yep. wrap it up. Um, yeah. You can be LSAT famous like Carlton and uh, like Dil, uh, Jared and Christian and uh, Elijah and all the other people who wrote in this week. Uh, all you got to do is email help at thinkinglsat.com. Uh, try to keep it short if you can. Uh, write it and then edit it to about one third of the length of your original email draft, please uh, help at thinking LSAT.com. If you have questions about the LSAT demon, email help at LSAT demon.com. We have easily the best customer service team ever. That's a bold claim. Um, but I stand by it. <laughs> Our help team is amazing. Email help at LSAT demon.com. They'll get back to you right away. Sort you all out. Um, check out our other podcast, LSAT demon daily. That's coming out five days a week, shorter episodes there featuring not just me and Ben, but also other people on our team sometimes. That was episode 341 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks all y'all for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school.